Many people believe that absurdities have been written about the work of hard rocks in ancient Egypt in particular, that some techniques would have since been lost. The argument put forward is that there is no evidence of the existence of techniques different from those currently used or considered. Conversely, we can argue that there is no evidence. We will see in the video that the usual hypothesis of wooden mortises is now discredited and that only hardened steel seems to be able to perform this function. Hardened steel mastered from the first Egyptian dynasties. A remarkable idea or a layman's delusion? That's what we're going to see today. In her book, The Guide to Egyptian Geology, Bonnie Samsell tells us this. Many of the granites used were certainly not extracted from quarries in the sense of extracting blocks directly from the mother rock. Naturally, blocks of the desired size and shape could be found and selected. The granites on the surface of the earth are fractured by their magmatic fabric and weathering. The surfaces were dressed with dolerite malls abraded with quartzite sand and cut using copper saws and sand. Nevertheless, she specifies, the problem still arises for larger blocks, such as those used for the construction of the pyramids or the gigantic statues that are found in Egypt. For the unfinished obelisk, however, the answer seems quite simple to her. Workers used dolerite malls weighing 4 to 5 kilo. However, in her text, it is not specified whether these dolerite malls were handled with any kind of aid instrument. Indeed, just by rubbing an object weighing 4 to 5 kilograms, human endurance would very quickly reach its limits. Regarding lifting the 4 to 5 kilogram object, the question doesn't even arise. If you know this channel, you've likely seen these ubiquitous rectangular holes, and which, according to the timeline that we can observe on site, would be the witnesses of the most recent techniques using wood to swell and break the granite. An idea against which Bonnie Samsell stands, and she tells us this. The rectangular holes found in the Aswain quarries are often interpreted as intended for wooden wedges soaked in water to inflate and burst the rock Recent experiments show that wood does not allow splitting the rock. The holes themselves must have been made using iron or steel tools. Just as the Greeks or Romans would do later. These extraction methods are still used today. Many of these holes seen in the granites of Egyptian archaeological sites could have been made at much more recent periods. At any rate, this is an opinion that I fully share. In his book A Career, Jean-Paul Grémillier, manager of a company specializing in granite, tells us about his Egyptian experience dating back about 20 years ago. He shared his fascination with Egyptian granite, a material he had long dreamed about when he wanted to learn more about it. I was not only impressed by the monuments themselves, but also by the genius of the men who had erected them. By the methods of extraction and cutting. Knowing that most of the monuments dated back more than a thousand years before our era, I had heard up to that point many theories, including that of wooden wedges. I never believed it because in my whole life, I have never met a single quarryman capable of bursting, a block of granite with a wooden wedge swollen with water or swollen by frost. This legend has remained ingrained in people's minds. It likely originated long ago, possibly from speculations made by Egyptologists. End of quote. Don't you find there's a slightly comforting side? When a granite professional talks about speculation, when Egyptologists give a technical opinion on hard stone cutting, this same Mr. Gremillier had also brought back from this trip a few samples of charcoal found on the site of the Aswen obelisk in order to have them carbon dated, 14 and even make a written record of it. However, he was each time sent back to square one by the environment, Egyptologists, whom he defines in his book as rather closed off and whose leaders categorically refuse any start of dialogue. Indeed, it is a scenario that I have experienced myself. A very French attitude which consists of never giving credit to people who do not have a degree in a particular discipline. 
In some sectors of the tertiary industry, this is starting to change a little bit, sure, but France still keeps a good 20 years behind in terms of mentality, while the world is moving forward. Understanding that the millennial generation, for example, brilliantly demonstrates that self-taught skills often surpass those from traditional curricula. Of course, I'm talking here about fields where you have to think, and not necessarily fields that primarily require concrete technical skills that can't be invented through reflection. Just like Bonnie Samsell, who we talked about at the beginning of the video. Our dear sir, he also has a pretty clear opinion on the iron issue. Convinced that it was used by Egyptian stonecutters after they weakened the granite through thermal shock. On this subject, he gives us a travel anecdote, an anecdote that we all experience together. Every time I go to Egypt with a group of enthusiasts. Of course, there's nothing really bad in this anecdote. But it must be acknowledged that if the assumptions shift a bit at the top of the Egyptological pyramid, let's agree, the virtuous effects are not yet felt where it is crucial that they be. Namely, on the ground where thousands of guides and speakers distill their knowledge to tourists or enthusiasts who come to discover the astonishing and formidable Egyptian heritage. So, during one of his tourist visits, an Egyptologist was giving explanations to the passengers of the bus in which this gentleman was, who took them from one archaeological site to another, he was explaining about the size of the granite with bronze tools. Needless to say, his blood boiled, and with a touch of diplomacy, he stops the Egyptologist to tell him this, this is my job, what you're saying is simply not possible. Of course, the Egyptologist bristles and responds that he has studied and knows what he's talking about. To which our protagonist hero retorted, studies, that's all well and good, but if what's written in your books is wrong, you're just repeating mistakes. I'm telling you, sir, you don't cut granite with bronze. In short, an exchange worthy of Nadal Federer which, as I was saying earlier, sheds light on this perennial argument of authority of the degree obtained. Ultimately, for enlightened minds, this is merely an indirect admission of an outdated mindset from the 80s era and its short-sleeved shirts. As far as I'm concerned, I maintain a very close, even friendly relationship with the people I work with on my trips. The tone is never provocative and the exchanges are much more constructive, always with great respect for the other, even if opinions differ. I warmly greet the registrants who will participate. During the next trip to Egypt, with whom I am already eager to share points of view and opinions on a question that never stops being debated, that's also the magic of Egypt. And as usual, for those who wish to join us and be part of the group, meet in the description of the video, where you will find all the info and useful links. So as these few selected pieces have shown, drawn from conclusions made in 2017 by the Petrology Department of the Terre Genesis Geology Center, the territory of ancient Egypt is rich in a petrographic variety, ranging from sedimentary rocks, such as sandstone and limestones, to metamorphic rocks, including plutonic igneous rocks, such as dolerite and diorite granites, as well as volcanic rocks such as basalt or andesite. Thanks to the fractures that occurred during the different phases of the formation of the Earth's crust reliefs, the hard rock massifs present faults and diaclases, these rock defects. Thus, the Egyptian quarrymen, from the very first dynasties, in less than 3,000, 200, 3,300, they were able to choose partially exposed or dislodged blocks, according to their needs in size and morphology. But extraction sometimes required more than just the removal of selected blocks. It is proposed by the technical authors we just mentioned that the Mortis technique could have been developed. Only hick. Some of his proposals talk about hardened steel mortises even before the academically accepted dating of the appearance of the Iron Age. As for bronze mortises, soft materials, this would pose a problem in the case of hard rocks like granite or basalt. Regardless of the scenario or materials used, it was essential to drill numerous and close holes and therefore to have a metal of sufficient hardness. 
We saw in the video that the usual hypothesis of wooden mortises is now discredited and that only hardened steel seems to be able to perform this function. This therefore means that, from the earliest Egyptian dynasties, hardened steel was already mastered. Something quite remarkable. The technique of the bloomery would therefore have been used from the 4th millennium before Christ by the Egyptians to produce steel tools essential for the construction of monuments and works of the first dynasties. There you go friends. I hope you enjoyed today's video and that the elements of the study that made this video possible will resonate with you. In order to see stone cutting in Egypt from another angle, an angle emanating from professionals and technicians. Looking forward to seeing you in the next video. As usual, take care and don't forget to keep the passion. Bye.